Hello, my name is Alina Zachary Ross and I am the superintendent of schools for the Ypsilanti Community School District. When I was a child, I attended St. Scholastica Elementary School in Detroit, Michigan. I also attended Grand Valley State University, Wayne State University, and Michigan State University. In my role as superintendent of schools, I'm responsible for the safety and security of all of our students and staff, implementing board policies, and ensuring that you have the best education possible. I have two adult children and I am married. And in my spare time, I enjoy cooking and when it's safe, traveling. Today, I'm going to be reading to you Brave Girl, Clara and the Shirtwaist Maker Strike in 1909. This book's author, it was written by Michelle Markell. The picture's illustration is done by Melissa Sweet. Let's get going. A steamship pulls into the harbor, carrying hundreds of immigrants and a surprise for New York City. The surprise is a dirt poor, just five feet tall, and hardly speaks a word of English. Her name is Clara Limelich. This girl's got grit, and she's going to prove it. Look out, New York. Clara knows in her bones what is right and what is wrong. What's wrong begins a few weeks after the Limelichs move into their tenement in America. No one hire Clara's father. They will, however, hire Clara. That's right, Clara. Companies are hiring thousands of immigrant girls to make blouses, coats, nightgowns, and other women's clothing. They earn only a few dollars a month, but it helps to pay for food and rent. So instead of carrying books to school, many girls carry sewing machines to work. Clara becomes a garment worker. There's Clara on her way to work. From dawn to dusk, She's locked up in a factory. Rows and rows of young women bend over their tables, stitching collars, sleeves, and cuffs as fast as they can. Hurry, hurry, hurry up, the bosses yell. Rat-a-tat-tat, hisses Clara's machine. The sunless room is stuffy from all the bodies crammed inside. There are two filthy toilets one sink and three towels for 300 girls to share. Clara learns the rules. If you're a few minutes late, you lose a half day's pay. If you prick your finger and bleed on the cloth, you're fined. If it happens a second time, you're fired. The doors are locked and you're inspected every night before you leave to be sure you haven't stolen anything from the factory. Wow, that's pretty tough. But Clara is uncrushable. She wants to read. She wants to learn. At the end of her shift, though her eyes hurt from straining in the gaslight and her back hurts from hunching over the sewing machine, she walks to the library. There's a picture of her reading her book. She fills her empty stomach with a single glass of milk and goes to school at night. When she gets home in the late evening, she sleeps only a few hours before rising again. As the weeks grind by, Clara makes friends with the other factory girls. 
At lunch, they share stories and secrets as if they were in school, where they belong. Clara smolders with anger, not just for herself, but for all the factory girls, working like slaves. This was not the America that she'd imagined. That's her and her other factory workers at lunch together. The men at the factory tell her they've been trying to get the workers to team up in a union. Then they strike, refuse to work, until the bosses treat them better. But the men don't think that the ladies are tough enough. Hmm, not tough enough. Because they're girls? Oh, yes, they are. Clara knows it. She'll show them. From then on, at the sewing tables and on the street corners, Clara urges the girls to fight for their rights. When the seamstresses are overworked, she says, strike. When they're underpaid, she says, strike. When they're punished for speaking up, what does she cry? Yeah, strike. And the girls do. There they are with their picket sign. They're on strike. Each time Clara leads a walkout, the bosses fire her. Each time she pickets, her life is in danger. The bosses hire men to beat her and the other strikers. The police arrest her 17 times. They break six of her ribs, but they can't break her spirit. It's shatterproof. Clara hides her bruises from her parents. A few days later, she's on the picket line again. And the other girls think, if she can do it, we can do it too. For weeks, the small strikes go on, but the bosses find other young women to do the work for the same low pay and long hours. We must do something bigger, think Clara and other union leaders. Something huge. A giant strike at every garment factory in the city. The union holds a meeting. Throngs of workers pack the seats, the aisles, the walls, the hall thrums with excitement. Clara listens to speech after speech. As all of the ladies from the factories just sitting there watching and listening. The speakers, mostly men, want everyone to be careful. Two hours pass. No one recommends a general strike. Finally, the most powerful union leader in the country goes up to the podium. Not even he proposes action. So guess what? Clara does. That's right, Clara. She calls out from the front of the hall. The crowds lift her to the stage where she shouts in Yiddish. I have no further patience for talk. I move that we go on a general strike. And she starts the largest walkout of women workers in U.S. history. And there's Claire up there in front of all of the workers and they are ready to strike. The next morning, New York City is stunned by the sight of thousands of young women streaming from the factories. One newspaper calls it an army. Others call it a revolt. It's a revolt of girls. Some were only 12 years old. And the rest are barely out of their teens. 
In the coming weeks, Clara is called a hero. She lights up chilly halls with her fiery pep talks. Her singing lifts the spirits of the picketers. She yells, stand fast girls. Oh, she's got them going. Look at all of them. They are standing there strong, striking. And they do. All winter long, in the bitter cold, in their cheap, thin coats, tired and starving and scared. The girls walk alongside the men on the icy sidewalks of the picket line. They spill out of the union halls, blocking the roads, filling streets corners and public squares. Newspapers write stories about them. College girls raise money for them. Rich women swap in fur coats, picket with the factory girls. By the time the strike is over, hundreds of bosses agree to let their staff form unions. They shorten the work week and raise salaries. The strikes embolden thousands of women to walk out of garment factories in Philadelphia and Chicago. All of these people join together to strike. And the strike convinces Clara to keep fighting for the rights of workers. Her throat is hoarse, her feet are sore, but she has helped thousands of people, proving that in America, wrongs can be righted, warriors can wear skirts and blouses, and the bravest hearts may beat in girls only five feet tall. This was Brave Girl, Clara and the Shirt Waist Maker Strike of 1909.